Whoever eats of me and drink of me will have life eternal. My dear people, if you will look at the two readings today, they are so beautiful. The first reading, of course, is the experience of humanity. We never satisfy. We always have to complain. If it's hot, it's hot. If it's cold, it's cold. If we have to go to work, it's too, it's too much. If we this, complain, complain, complain. That is one of the factors to identify our humanity. And what happened in that reading is the experience of every people of every time. God gave them everything. He rescued them from the Pharaoh. They saw the Pharaoh drowned and still complaining, we have no bread. And they complained, why did not you leave us where we were in Egypt? You brought us here to die. And God said to Moses, listen, I know that they complain to you because you represent me. Tell them, in the morning I will send manna from heaven. And in the evening I will send quail so that they have enough bread and meat to eat. And later on he gave them water. And that is a prophecy of what's going to happen. Jesus came, and today's gospel is the fulfilling, the fulfilling of that beautiful prophecy. We see that Jesus said, people, you are looking for me not because you believed in me. You, are be you came to me because you are eating prey, because I am healing your sick, because I am doing good for you. You are coming to me because you always want, but you don't want to put faith in and that's why he said to them, it is not Moses who gave them bread in the desert. It was my father. And so now, it is the father who sent this bread. And I am the bread of life. And whoever eats of me and drinks of me will have life. And today we see in the second reading how St. Paul reminds us that this transformation, that now we are eating the body and blood of Christ, has to make a difference. St. Paul said, put the old self. You don't live like pagans. You are now baptized. You immerse yourself in the waters of baptism. You plunge yourself in that water where you left yourself there and you rise from that water to be a new creation. Put that new creation. Act like Christ. So anyone who see you acting like Christians, they come to believe in him. Last Sunday, if you notice, I begin the first part of the Mass. As I told you, the Mass is divided into two parts, two main parts. Liturgy of the Word, Liturgy of the Eucharist. And yesterday, uh, last Sunday, we discussed together what is the first part of the Mass, and we say that from the beginning, after the prayer of the faithful, is the first part of the Mass. Where God speaks to us, we respond to God, and then, of course, after we hear the experience of the early Christians, we hear the Word of Christ, and after that, we profess our faith by immersing ourselves again in the promises of baptism. And we see that we all profess that God is our Father, God is our Redeemer, and also God is our Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier. And there we conclude the first part. Today, I'm going to speak about the second part of the Mass, which is called the Eucharistic part, eh? the Eucharistic table. And we know that the liturgy of the Eucharist consists into three parts. The offering, the emulation of the, gift of the victim, and the consummation of the victim. That is what the three parts, uh, the second part, consists uh, of the Mass. We begin with the first part. Many times, you know, you see the ushers come to you and ask to take the gift. And many of you say, oh no, I'm not dressed properly, oh no, people look at me, oh no. You know, I don't want to look holy or holy. Little we know that in that call, you are being called to represent the people in that community. And in the little bread and the little wine that you are going to carry, you are going to bring to the altar what God gave us. And God wants us to give him what he gave us. God is asking us, like he asked last Sunday, the young boy to give him the five loaves. And although it was a surprise for Philip and for Andrew that he can feed 500 
5,000 people with those loaves, God not only fed them, but there was left over because God does not give us how much we need, but more than we need. It's like when you go and have a handful of seed and put it in the ground. After three months that the product is done, whether it is flour, whether it is, you know, uh, veggie, you are going to have three times, four times that you have put in the ground. And sometimes more than you need because uh, you put one plant of tomato and you have to give them away because you're going to consume them all. How many there will be? Why? Because this is, this is the abundance that God gives to us. We, but God wants us to plant. God does not want to keep what he gave us to ourselves. If I have that handful of seed and put them in a drawer and spring comes around and I left them there, don't expect me to go and collect harvest. God wants me to put down. God wants me to plant. And that's exactly the first thing. God wants us to give. And when we give, he, in return, he gives us his abandonment. He gives us his blessing. And that is exactly what we do. Many times you think, you know, well, I'm not going to give money because the church has so much money. And after all, I don't know what the pastor is doing with this money. Oh, I don't know. And all kinds of excuses. Didn't we know? That is not what they do with it, but what you did with it. Your intention is to help the church, to educate, to help the poor, and also support the buildings where you go. Now, what the pastor do, it's not your business, it's, it's not anyone's business. After all, he has to be uh, report, he has to be answerable to those in, uh, on, uh, that are superior to him. But what we are going to do in that collection, we are going to give the best we can give. And God in return will bless it. I never gave without receiving double of what I gave. Because God is so blessed, is so full of blessing. And that is exactly what the offertory is. We give to God in that offertory, so we'll be bring, brought up. And so we people are going to bring to, our, to God our work. It's not what the priests say. This is and uh, the work of the workmen of, of men, uh, the, er, the fruit of the earth, work of men, and now we are going to offer it to God. So God, instead of making work of men, make it a divine, a divine exchange. And there he was going to give us the very gift of his son. It's the same with the graves. We collect graves, we crush them, the Jews that come out of the graves, we put them together, and then we offer it to God, and God in return is going to give us the gift, not of grapes, that cheer the heart for a while, but give us his own son who cheers the soul for eternity. And after the priest take those gifts and offer them, that is the offering. And that prayer that priests use uh, on the gift of the bread and wine is the same prayer the Jewish people, the Jewish priests used to say when the people bring their tithes to the Lord. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, because you have blessed our fields and gave us this product, and we have worked it with our hands, and make it now bread, as we give it to you, so that you make it now the bread of life. The same thing on the, on the wine. So the prayer the priest used is the, priest, is the prayer of the Old Testament that the priest has to use when the people bring one-tenth of their income to the Lord. Many people say, I have to give one-tenth of my, of my income to God. But let us th take it very, very easy here. One-fifth has to go to your parish church where you belong. One-fifth has, uh, has to go to the, uh, to the charities of your own. So if there is ten, 5% will go to your church, 5% will go to your preferable charity. Maybe house of charity, maybe some missions that you know, maybe some uh, other people that you know who are really in need. Very good. Then after the offering, and the priest offer it, he comes to wash his hands. Because although he is the priest on our behalf, he is equal like us. He is human. And he has to tell God to wash him from his impurity, from his sinfulness, 
in order to be able to be fitting to offer this gift. Not that he is worthy to be fitting to open this gift. And after the prayer over the gifts, then we enter into the solemn and beautiful prayer called the Eucharistic prayer, where the priest on behalf of the people, and that's why with his open arms, he stretched his arms to God and opened himself to really be a mediator between God and humanity. And first of all, he asked the Lord to be with us, because without God we cannot do it. Then he is asking us now to eliminate from our minds anything that is destructive, uh, dis to distract us out of it from this gift. And we say we have offered our heart to the Lord. And then we say this is right and, and just that we are doing this. And then the, the priest on behalf of the people again enter in front of the Eternal Father because that prayer of the prophets is always addressed to the Father. And there he expressed to the Father what we are celebrating. Man, many times is the celebration of the Eucharist we are doing. Whether this is Paschal Mystery, whether it's the Nativity of Christ, whatever it is. In that preface, we have the prayer of the priest who is offering to the God the Father for our intercession. And then, of course, we come to the most important part of the Mass. And that is when we sing to God the hymn of Moses. Holy, holy, holy is God Almighty. Remember when Moses was in front of the burning bush, how he asked God uh, and God come to his presence. And while he was saying, holy, 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 and Moses was asked to take off the shoes because holy is the ground that he is, because God now is in presence. And we sing that not only he is holy, that now we have arrived at the very, very altar of sacrifice, the altar of heaven. And then the priest will begin the Eucharistic prayer, which is again a prayer offered on behalf of the community, for the community to the Eternal Father. And that's why the priest opened his arms. The extension of the open of the arms remind us of Moses when he was asked by Aaron uh, to really help to intercede for the people. How when his hands was up, the chosen people were winning the war. When his tired arms went down, the chosen people were losing. The idea of the extension of arms is the dependency, that we depend totally and completely on God, and He is the one who can come to us. Then, of course, after the Eucharist, during the Eucharistic prayer, the priests come now to the very part of the Mass, and that is the, as we say, destruction of the victim. At that moment, when, G, when the priests take the, take the bread, and take the chalice filled with wine and pronounce, this is my body, this is my blood. At that very moment, he proclaimed the death of Christ on the, on the cross. At that very moment, we experience the very dying of Jesus. And that's why we separate bread and wine, body and blood. They are not together. The priest not this is my body and blood. This is my body, this is my blood. Because at that very moment, we experience the dying Jesus. And that's why the people say, after the priest said, it's a mystery of faith. He said, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. At this very moment, we proclaim his death. And the priest continues the celebration of the Eucharistic prayer by offering to God the Father on behalf of his community all that the Savior has accomplished. Not only the resurrection and the ascension, but also he reminds us of those saints who really were before us, who work like us and were like us, and today because they believe and act like the believers, they really are in the hands of the arms of God. We pray for our dead because we unite ourselves with them in that same in that same prayer of the Eucharist. And that's why the priest now, after he pray for the church, the local, uh, the universal church, the local church, then he will say to us that we will do this in Christ's name, to him, with him, in him, all glory and praise will be given to the Father. And in that doxology, eh, through him, with him, in him, the church now comes together with one voice from north to, from north to south, from east to west, cry the Amen. How hard it is 
when you are at the altar and sometimes people do not even know that they have to answer Amen. Because the priest has prayed on your behalf. Now in support of the priest and in faith in the, in the mystery you are celebrating with one voice we say Amen. I believe that this is what we are all about. The, celebrating the mystery of our faith. And then of course the priest begin the rite of communion. At that very moment the church asks us to say the Pater Noster, the Our Father. In that prayer we have the gist of all that we believe. We believe in God, that His name is holy, that not only He is holy, but also He is a provider, and give us our daily bread. Why? Because that's what we need, that you nourish us by the bread of life, the prayer, the uh, antiphon before the, the, the gospel was this. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And we need that direction in our lives in order to understand where we are going. I cannot go there if I don't know there how to get there. And so the Father, through His Son, gave us the direction, the direction of His very word. Then we pray that He will forgive us because we are human beings. We have done evil in His sight. And we ask Him that we will ask His forgiveness with one condition, that we too will forgive those who sin against us. And the most important, to deliver us from evil, to deliver us from the occasion of sin. Because, as you know, we are human, and although we pray that we are so attached to Christ, Many times because of our humanity, you are whom you are, you will fail. After the Paternoster and we say the prayer uh, that follows, because we are doing this, because we are experienced, and from now, the coming of Jesus, we say together with the priest, because we believe that Jesus will come in glory. And that glory for us is the hope for what we are celebrating the Eucharist. Then the priest, of course, enter into a time of intercession where he asks God the Father through his Son Jesus Christ to give us peace, the peace that we need in our lives. You know, many times, you know, it's better to have nothing to eat than to have trouble in your life because trouble can, can kill people. Sometimes hunger is better. Maybe you become a little slim, but trouble many times destroys you destroy people. And that's why we say, we ask the peace that God only can give. That peace that comes from heaven. That peace that really shower us and give us the courage to live in harmony with ourselves and others. And that's why the priest asks us to share the peace of Christ with one another. And that is not a time of socialism. Many people say, oh, how you doing? How nice knowing you. Oh, peace. Oh, where are you going today? That is really not the, the, it's not really the means, it's not a break, it's not an interval, it's not what we say, you know, let us chat for two minutes. But the peace that you share with the one next to you is represent the whole people in your life, in your path of life. Sometimes even your sister, that you did not talk to her for some time. Many times your neighbor, sometimes it's your son, sometimes it's those people you know, who are really close to you, and sometimes because of what they say, you try to uh, shut your, yourself from them. And so in that, in, that, in that atmosphere, you reconcile with one another. And when you reconcile with them, we fulfill the words of Jesus. If you come to the altar, and there you remember that you have something to do with your brother, go first reconcile, and then you come and continue the offering. We cannot approach the sacrament of unity when we are divided from one another. We are one church. We are the body of Christ. We are what we are because of Christ as our head and we are the body. We are the members of that body. And so if I am separated from this one, I am not fully united with Christ. And that's why the church put that peace there. Not socialism, but to really understand that now I am free from all those grudges, from all those things that I hold that not unite me with Christ as unite me with my brothers and sisters. And then after that the priest will say 
uh, with, with the, uh, invite us to say the Anu's Day. And what is the Anu's Day? Lamb of God, who was designed by God to become the, the victim by which I can be saved, have mercy on me. That Lamb of God who died on the cross, have mercy on me. That Lamb of God who represents that I belong to him because I said just celebrate the Paschal mystery, which is the lamb, the Pascha, the Paschal uh, lamb that the Jewish people has emulated to God, and now Christ becomes the Paschal mystery, he becomes the lamb emulated to God, have mercy on us. And then the priest say the prayer for himself before receive communion. It's a beautiful prayer that sometimes it is said under soft voice, but I wish it said loudly. And the priest say, by this body and blood, help me for my journey to eternity. May this bread and life, breath of Christ, this take away everything from me that is simple. And may this bread and blood do not ever separate me from this union that I hope one day I have with God. And then the priest, of course, at that very moment, he, at the Lamb of God, he will break the host. And he break the host purposely to remind us that Christ was broken for us on the cross. And that is a reflection of our brokenness for one another. That now we are called like Christ to be broken in service of one another. But the priest will take piece of that host and put it in the chalice. At that very moment the priest unite Christ body and soul. As we told you already, the bread and wine is separated at the time we proclaim the death of the Lord. At communion we don't receive a, receive a corpse, but we receive the resurrected Christ, the life, the, li the living Christ. And that's why the priest takes that piece of holes, put in the chalice. At that moment, after the priest say his prayer, he lifts up the host to us and say, Ecce Anius Dei, Ecce Quetoli Peccata Mundi. This is the Lamb of God. This is the Lamb who was sacrificed for you. This is Jesus who now is calling you for this beautiful interaction with him, interpersonal with him. And we say, Lord, I am not worthy, because none of us are worthy, that you will come under my roof, the words of the centurion, eh? but only say a word, and my soul shall be healed. And after the priest received, at that very moment, the Mass ended. By the consummation of the priest receiving communion, the bread and wine, at that very moment, the mass, uh, is, uh, the sacrifice is ended because the priest now consumes the body and blood of Christ. And then, of course, he invites us to partake in the celebration of receiving communion to enter into union with Christ. After that, the priest will say the prayer over communion. We call it the post-communion, which is really what we have just celebrated is now what we are going to live. Mass is not ended because we go to church and leave. Mass begins when we leave the doors of the church. That prayer after communion is really what we need to do in order to make the celebration of the Eucharist alive because the Mass has to continue. The Mass is not ended by the words of the priest but begin at that very moment by his commission after he bless us and send us in the name of Christ, in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, he commissions us to bring that peace, that joy, what we have experienced, that direction, to give it to others that we meet. Dear people, this is the second part of the Eucharist. It's very beautiful that we understand perfectly what we celebrate. The Eucharist is divided into two parts, the Word and Eucharist, they need each other. I cannot come to the table before I know what I am coming from. And I cannot come to, I cannot go to the table of the Eucharist before I go to the table of the Word. I cannot go to the table of the Word and remain there because the Word leads me to the table of the Eucharist. Why? Because the Word of God is Jesus Christ. The Word incarnate really become for us a person to person in which I build a relationship. I build a personal relation with him. And as I receive his direction, and I receive him 
in a very special way, I become Alter Christus. I become another Christ. So the message that I receive through the celebration of the Eucharist will make a difference in me, and that will make a difference in other people I meet. God bless you.